um, for for the discussion. I think thank you so much. Um, what is the problem to be solved? Uh, you know, that's such a such a good question. Um, I, I'd like to structure um, the sort of beginning of our discussion around three of the um, sort of uh, major assumptions that were included in the um, recently published textbook on the science of science communication, which which lays out these three assumptions. Firstly, that science is not monolithic. Secondly, that the aspects of science being debated are actually a function of the nature of the science and the applications that that enables and the societal implications of those applications for good or ill. Obviously, we've seen applications, you know, that are very fearful, um, yeah, with the connotations of war and weapons and waste and so on. But, you know, there could also be very positive connotations um, associated with the applications of this technology. And then ultimately, what are the, the social dynamics around these technologies? So, so that's the second point. And the third is, of course, that communication is um, an inevitable part of the process of characterizing the scientific findings. So um, with uh, your permission and without wishing to sort of um, ask you Baruch to uh, repeat yourself you've already given us so much advice good advice that I think we ought to you know go away and act upon it and then come back for for more but um, looking at this question of science not being monolithic does nuclear technology have to be monolithic or are there ways in which emerging technologies could be more successful in building public confidence uh, than the industry has been historically and if that's if so, what does success actually look like? What's the problem that we're solving? Or to ask the question slightly differently, under what circumstances could everyone get really comfortable in a 10,000 reactor world? Uh, that, well, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank, thank my, my colleagues for the two really great, great talks because and the complementarity. So, I'm basically kind of an engineer. I do my work in an engineering department. I have a degree in math. I like to analyze problems. So I'm, I'm all for information, but it's what's the information that's relevant to a particular kind of decision, which you don't know without getting to people. And how do you get a hearing for the information, if you, which you don't get a hearing unless you have the kind of respectful process that Seth and Nick talked about in, 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 in great, great detail. Um, you know, I, I would, if I had to guess, I would say that uh, that SMRs, which I know a fair amount from about mostly from from members of your uh, members of a couple of members of your uh, of your your, uh, your your panel, probably has the opportunity to get a hearing by establishing independent relationships with local stakeholders who are. Uh, who will um, who will buy their trust? Who will listen to them in the way that both Seth and Nick Nick show will realize that the des uh, well, design sounds manipulative, but in some sense, the design of the communication process is as valuable in, in economic terms as the you know as the third significant figure in some kind in some part of a regulatory filing or the next uh, forty thousand words in a legal. Uh, in a le legal filing, and that has never been the case. I mean, it's been, you know, as we heard in the first talk today, there was a little bit of pop psychology went wrong and then they flipped to another kind of pop, pop psychology. So this has to be treated as strategic and we have to have to do it. So you could say, well, I want to, uh, so we had, you know, I think Seth spoke about, well, do you want to do this co-located or distribute it. So that's an interesting question. But imagine you wanted to do, uh, and it's likely to be, the, the conditions are likely to be similar. You, you probably go for some co-location. Co so what I would think about what would a systematic communication program be, would be getting to know the community, building their trust, not making this a fait accompli, have empirically, scientifically grounded communications to explain to them, have scientifically grounded two-way communication, that is, listen to them in a disciplined way, it, as we just heard, that will lis listen to them, and, and, have, and, and have continuing stable social relations. And so uh, uh, Ahmed and I, if you're one of your panelists, and I, 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 I kind of a few weeks ago, I sent him uh, some, some documents, some, some uh, transactional things, from a fight over big solar 
in the place in rural Northwest Ohio, where, my, where our daughter, where our daughter, daughter lives, and and the big companies who are investing in it are doing absolutely everything wrong. Mm. You know, they are like big nuclear. And it's big solar, but they're you know, and it's and it's doing wrong. There are a few boutique firms that are establishing the kind of stable relationships. They're not parachuting a consultant in from Chicago every once in a while, and it's a different consultant every time. They're not changing the design in a way that the experts, the technical experts decide is functionally equivalent, but it's very different to the community. Uh, we might be able to do it if, you know, a, a, an example that Seth just gave, the community trusted you doing the best and you went ahead and you just checked with them to say, if we change the orientation or, or so on. And then this morning, Ahmed sent me, sent me big, big wind, you know, blowing things in exactly the same, you know, the, the same way. So my guess is that if, uh, you can gen if you can generate the capital needed to produce SMRs within an institutional structure that is 180 degrees different than the traditional nuclear in in industry, that does not have top-down management that somehow shaped in the, cold, uh, in the Cold War, that does not have leadership that has perpetuated a culture of psychological trauma of the rejection from the 19, 1960s, then you might have a chance. But it would take very strong strategic, uh, strategic leadership, and it would be a rare, in, a rare industry that was capable of, uh, of, of, of doing it. And it would be, have to be done by people who are willing to do more than to listen to a talk and read a paper by a psychologist or a sociologist. Say, yeah, now I got it. I can, I can, yeah, I heard one, I can, I, I, I can do it. There's your detailed design process needed to be data driven and so on. That would be absolutely radical in terms of really any large, any large industry. So I think it's in the industry's hand to, uh, you know, to see whether it can make a go of it. It is not impossible. I think it's unlikely though. <laughs> Well, it's going to be fundamentally important for all the technologies, given the scale of the clean energy transition. And, and we were hearing that from Seth. And, and actually, I have a comment here from Jacqueline. I don't know, Jacqueline, if you'd like to come on camera and, and ask your question. I think it's super relevant. Um, and congratulations from Jacqueline to all the panelists. Oh, great. There you are. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No, this Hi. has been a really uh, terrific day listening to everybody that both panels. Um, and um, Dr. Tuller, you referenced equity, um, but I was thinking throughout the whole um, session, like, like all the talks about stakeholder engagements and um, the principles of good stakeholder engagement certainly is um, applicable to thinking about this through the lens of energy justice, but I didn't hear anything like more specific. Like I was just wondering if any of the panelists wanted to um, comment on how a lens of a lens of EJ and environmental justice or energy justice would affect what we've been hearing today, what we've been learning about in terms of societal preferences or how to um, engage with the public. Great, thank you. Thanks, Jacqueline. Yeah, very, very uh, pertinent. I don't know, um, Nick, if you, I mean, I, I know equity is a is a important theme in the values work and, and then I'll invite you, Seth, to comment on that too. It is and yeah, just I think just briefly. I mean, obviously, again, Seth's work touches on this as well. I mean, you've got distributional equity, then, which is you know where, where are the risks and benefits being shared out um, amongst a local community if we're talking there, um, and then there's process equity. So the fair and Brooke has just talked about this that you know that's the that whole period of time um, before a siting decision is made and a community decides it wants in some ways to have that but then there's also reckon, something called recognition justice which is a bit more um subtle and it's to do with just sort of understanding the identity and the, the place and the people who may be asked about this facility so that could be a question just really listening to people's concerns more broadly which may not even be about necessarily the technology or, or how it is going going to work um, I was going to, a slightly facetious suggestion, um, I'd, I've got a suggestion for where you should cite the first SMR in the United States, and you won't like this, but it's come from focus group research, citizens raise it very 
frequently if you have a group about you know where we, where should we put the first one to ensure it's okay and they will say um, stick it in the mall just outside the White House because if it's safe there it'll be you know they're going to make sure it's really safe if it goes there um, and then we'll have one here and, and you know I've heard citizens say that so many times and it is only a facetious comment but it, you know it says don't stick it in some quiet backwater out of the way in the north of Scotland um, where they where they put you know they put our first fast breeder reaction for, for very good reasons well away from any large center of population because they didn't really know that much about the technology at that time um, you know if you're confident in it you need to put it somewhere where um, some of the decision makers are at risk uh, so how you you know how you square that one I don't know because nobody is happier now from a regulatory perspective of citing such facilities close to major centers of population so you wouldn't get it past your regulator but um have a think about that i mean that's that's how citizens uh, i think view that uh issue but anyway that's just my sort of slightly not entirely serious suggestion for there's your day. uncontroversial recommendation to the national committee there <laughs> <laughs> uh so seth would you like to comment on the equity question as well yeah i think um nick um you know he mentioned that there's distributional equity, um, there's procedural equity. Um, I think from the, um, the point of view of um, engagement processes about what you know this might look like in, with an environmental justice or climate justice lens is about thinking about power. You know, mm -hmm. who has power um, to make decisions? I brought that up about is it the local officials or you know that were elected maybe not to make that decision um, that would really impact a community or is it others. Um, and that brings, brings up questions of how we make processes more inclusive. You know, who shows up, who can show up, um, who feels comfortable showing up to these different kinds of um, engagement processes, um, um, what time they're held, you know, the meetings, all these kinds of things are really important. Also, um, making them more oriented towards um, learning, <clears throat> in a sense, and dialogue. And again, this is really about comfort. Um, uh, and engaging in the process because if you're the only person from one group, it's very hard to um, necessarily voice how you always feel. And we hear this a lot in, on campuses around um, uh, race equity and race inclusion and things like that as well. Um, but I also think um, um, things like technical assistance, you know, so that um, different groups, different parts of communities can. Get, get their own experts and think about their own, you know, develop their own information that's relevant is really important. And also I think um, um, there's also a thing here about scale and having a bigger lens, you know, to look at what are the potential impacts. Um, and, um, you know, I, so I live in Massachusetts and this is just an example around solar, you know, there's a lot of opposition, some, not a lot, there's sometimes opposition to solar and, the, you know, the lens around that is very small scale, but, you know, if it had a bigger lens about, well, um, should we import energy hydropower from um, northern Quebec um, and what the impacts are there and, and, and the native communities there, you know, we'd have a really different discussion about equity and, and justice. Um, and so I think that um, broadening the lens around some of these questions is also really important, which goes back to the question about like, what's the system, right? Um, yeah, I think so. this is, yeah, this is l l so many, so many rich veins of inquiry here. This question about power and representation and actually in Spencer Weert's book, The Rise of Nuclear Fear, he proffered an, uh, a theory or a hypothesis around, you know, the, the sort of the tendency for um, uh, groups within society that are more exposed to existential risk, um, women, young people, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, to also be more opposed to climate, uh, to nuclear power and more worried about climate change. So that, that correlation that we've seen repeatedly in many studies is, you know, that we don't quite understand, but that could be an explanation is, is really linked to power. The fact that, that you know, the more powerful groups in society, you know, older white men tend to be less worried about climate change and less worried about the risks from nuclear power as well. Um, I'm fortunate that my husband is willing to put my kids to bed so I'm able to be here. Uh, <laughs> but not everybody has that luxury and the importance of, of understanding the you know, diverse needs and, and requirements. Go ahead, Seth. 
Well, I would say, and also those um, are also people who are less likely to be able to participate in discussions about it. Exactly. Um, so, Nick? Um, yeah. Nick, Baruch? Nick, yeah, okay. go ahead. I'm just, uh, oh, go ahead, Nick, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was about to say, you've got to be a bit careful about that. You know, there is a well-known gender effect, and initially it was, yeah. Yeah, so in all surveys, it, women are slightly less um, accepting of nuclear energy, see more risk than men. But if you look at this, what the actual distribution tells you in, in that data, what you find is a sort of a, a kind of very gung-ho group of white males who are much mm. more positive about nuclear energy than everybody else. That's the first thing. So it, it's not actually anything about the majority of women and men. It, it's about this other group that's then pulling the mean apart. Um, but then what's really interesting, we, we had a project on this. We looked into very closely at some of that, actually some of the data I showed earlier and, and looked at the way women and men were talking about nuclear energy. Uh, again, this may come up tomorrow in the science and technology studies and, and, and it was it was clear that, that there's something called if in the in the gender literature the effects made by gender that it's to do with the way in which boys and girls orient towards or, or are oriented towards technology very early on it's nothing to do with biology at all um it's more to do and i think some of your certainly in the uk our physics institution has worked this one out yeah. that girls have put off mathematics very early on when they reach about 16. Uh, particularly in mixed gender much school. earlier yeah uh, really much earlier early. they don't become engineers etc cetera, etc cetera. so and, and 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 then there's then you get a hesitation in the focus groups which does look like people don't know what they're talking about or don't know but actually at the end of the day you realize when you've done the two hours or the three hours six hours that the women knew as much as the men about this stuff and, and had as many concerns to bring to the table, but we're just kind of, because this was a techie thing and it's, it is gendered, it's a big male project, then they felt less empowered to talk about it at the start. Um, so there's some quite complicated stuff around that. Please do not um, uh, conclude from the, white, from the gender effect that just let's tell women about the technology and it will all be fine, because it won't, yeah. it's much more. Sorry, but but it, but long answer yeah. to that one, but. No, no, that's that's great. And it does come back to the kind of question about knowing your audience as well and the sort of importance of the messenger as well as the message. Baruch, please. Yeah, about uh, 25 years ago, as I've been, I've, I've, 25 years ago, I was on uh, an Institute of Medicine panel uh, committee, sort of like, like this one on uh, environmental justice. And we were, because of, probably because of the composition of the committee, we were taken in by, by various affected communities. And it was startling how little they trusted the scientists. They mistrusted the lawyers even more, but they mistrusted the science. Even the polluters they liked more because there were some jobs, something came into the uh, get into the community. So two of our three, so we had one recommendation which was the obligatory National Academy asked for money, more money for science. And the other two were, were, about, were about communication, one on content mm. and one on a process. Um, about... Um, in 2010, Seth, I, and our, our late friend, Jean Rosa, were the first three authors on a uh, science policy forum piece lamenting that the blue ribbon panel on America's nuclear future, which is somebody not all that different from your panel, um, ha had dug itself into a, a deeper hole in trust by holding hearings in which only well-heeled people could show up with no opportunity, you know, demonstrating its disregard and disinterest you know, it wasn't its intent, but that was the perception for those who happen to know about about the about the about the proceedings. And and a third thing from a, uh, for, from so last year at this time I was working on the academy's uh, committee on um, on equitable allocation of a vaccine. And I just sort of looked two things that 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 one thing that our staff did that we had a hearing where they really went out of their way to bring people who are typically not at the table to 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 listen listen to us and it was something you could do in the in in the zoom era and if this, your committee is thinking about hearing sessions you might talk to lisa brown and her staff about how they managed to bring that off and the second that with vaccine we proposed a communication strategy that had centralized gathering and 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 uh, testing of 
of communications that would serve different audiences, because that's a relatively rare skill, simultaneously with a bottom-up um, strategy of partnering with the local trusted local agents, whether to the HBCUs, the community college in rural areas, the school nurses or other who could explain this information. Once they knew what, what there was to explain and what are the best ways to explain it, tailor it to their own you know, to their own communities. And I, I think it will take that, and, and it was not done, of course, uh, still not done. And we're all suffering from that, from the big pandemic uh, communication yeah. uh, 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 problems. Yeah, I mean, some of these important principles, never mind putting the uh, first SMR in the mouth, we should be sort of carving these into stone and putting those in the mouth, shouldn't we, to <laughs> best practices for successful science communication, because actually many of the kind of best case studies out there that have been really successful in engaging the public in controversial issues, whether it's marriage equality or, um, or other things, um, have been led by trusted, credible, authoritative leaders within communities who are armed with, you know, good information and able to really engage with their own peers. Um, in a way that 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 builds trust and 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 leads to, you know, good decision making ultimately. Um, so I will turn now to some of my committee members. Um, uh, Todd, I think you 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 had your hand up and you're going to pivot us to to a new a new topic, please. Yeah, thanks. It's sort of a two parter. I think the first part is more aimed at Seth and the second part at anyone. But Seth, is there an example where somebody has studied actually giving a community a choice? Right. Normally, it seems like you come in and you say, we've got a solar plant, dear community, evaluate this. Or dear community, we have a nuclear plant, evaluate. Is there a case where people have actually mm -hmm. gone in and said, we'll give you a choice? So that's question one. And then second, a lot of the discussion is sort of around the idea of what's the way, what are the best ways to engage in the siting process? But I would imagine that what happens for the next number of decades after you build that plant um, can be just as important to the success of the project and the acceptance of the community and the way outside communities might view a previous example. And so I've wondered if that's been studied, sort of the, the longitudinal long view of, of these, these processes. So, thanks. Um, I'm gonna have to think hard about that question, that first part of that question. I think it's more typical that um, the choice is about a singular technology and then um, that gets discussed and if it's rejected, then you know something else might come along and especially when it's at the community scale or a municipal scale, maybe at a regional scale or a state scale the, the, the answer is different. Um, well, it is different. Um, I think um, but the one that comes to mind the most is um, that the uh, chemical weapons demilitarization, Program. So it wasn't about an energy generation, but it was about communities that were grappling with a choice about what kind of technologies to use for that. And they did choose, you know, they were able to grapple with that. Um, so I don't think that's a very satisfactory answer right away, but I'll think about it some more and about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, what a, what a great question. Yeah, Todd, do you, have you come across such a... <laughs> No, no, I haven't, right? But it seems to me that's the problem, right? Is we don't start with the what what pathway is of the most value for your community, assuming that hosting energy infrastructure is the choice, yeah. right? It it's, doesn't seem like it's ever that way, but it seems like you'd potentially be more successful if you started that conversation. Well, I think so, that institutionally, we're not also set in, in terms of governance. We're not set up to do that. I mean, that's part of the problem maybe of trying to think of a good case because... Mm you know, that's not how it really works, right? I think, um, you know, in most cases, a developer would come in and say, oh, you know, we have this great idea for siting a solar, commercial solar array here, or a biomass plant, or, or a nuclear you know, reactor, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, they're not in the business of giving people choices because they have, they're just proponent for one choice, right? Um, and so that's why I don't think that really I can't think of a case at a, at a local yeah. level like that. Well, maybe at the national level. I mean, the, in some ways, this is what the 2050 Pathways project was about, was was inviting people to design their own um, pathway to a yeah. Nick. I think at a state level, I mean, you know, oh. Massachusetts is coming up with um, pathways to energy, you know, um, mm -hmm. decarbonization, and there's different pathways that 
they're proposing um, with different energy mixes. And so now how much of a discussion has there been in the state about that and whether, you know, back to the last question, has that been inclusive, you know, and um, how does that relate mm -hmm. to climate justice and energy justice? I don't think that it's done a very good job so far. I was just going to add, I mean, to this one, that because um, one of the reviewers, when, when our big energy system change project went to review the first few times, the reviewer sensibly said, well, could this be done at the local level? So, so it just depends where you define the boundary of the problem. Is it, you know, you're doing it for Massachusetts or you're doing it for Washington or you're doing it for the US as a whole? So um, it's true at a, in terms of a real life case study with developers coming in, it's almost impossible to get, you know, choices at the same time being placed by the same community, but you, you can do it hypothetically. So we have actually just finished a piece of research um, in a small steel town near us called Port Talbot. It's got, it's one of UK's largest carbon emitters, has a lot of heavy industry. It's got lots of issues of, you know, how would you decarbonize a place like that and keep jobs? and keep the community vibrant. So we we kind of, well, downscale is not the right word because we, we had to extend it to a series of interviews plus workshops with local community members. And we took them through four scenarios, ways in which the town could go. I mean, one would be a very high, actually lots of nuclear power still linked to the grid, nothing much changing in the town um, other than the steelworks and get them working with hydrogen through to a much more locally based um, energy system where where you know all there are solar panels on roofs there's local production of hydrogen etc so it can be done and and i think there will be more at a research level you can get you gain insights again about the values that people want um and and the criticism of, of our original piece of work is it's not embedded anywhere it's not does isn't located anywhere it was and the calculator is the same Kirsty. it's just for the uk so then you've got that difficulty of bringing it, bringing it into people's lives and trying to get them to understand how they might be affected in 20 or 30 years time by all these changes. Um, so as a research, it's quite hard to do, I think. You know, you need major, I hate to say it, I, I, I hate to say we need more research in the social sciences, but here there is a good case. The UK also, following the National Citizens Assembly, which was again, two years ago about it was run and it was at the, it was talking about decarbonization nationally there have been a lot of local citizens assemblies have um, um sprung up and i don't know if that's a that's a feature of the us yet but it's certainly a european thing that's happening and they've sort of appeared along with the extinction rebellion movement as well to try and say you know how would a local place take forward the decarbonization agenda so there there are a lot of also bottom-up initiatives that are occurring um, that start to answer Todd's question, I think. That's great. Thank you. Now, Todd, you said you had two parts. Oh, Baruch, would you like to respond okay, on this? You know, I was just going to say, I would say, let, I would not call what Nick and, and Seth do just research, because in some sense, they are working problems, helping communities understand one another, uh, creating a culture of collaboration within and across community, communities, industry, mm -hmm. and, 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 and government. So more of that is more social interest. That, that kind of research is build social infrastructure. And unlike people who do experiments on people in real life, and in the limited situations where you can treat the world like a like a lab, which are, which are if anything degrading our our, our our social social contract. Thinking about the, the about the longer term, um, the uh, so if people here in fracking country would want to know, um, well, where is the escrow account? with the money for long-term remediate decommissioning and site restoration, should you, the developer, go, go bankrupt? Mm -hmm. Which is what, of course, what happens in, in many extractive, uh, extractive places. So I think that would be part of the long-term contract. Yeah, that's great. So I think Nick and Seth, you should, you should put that into your biography, that wonderful compliment that Baruch just gave you building social infrastructure. <laughs> um, Todd, did you want to add a, a second part to your question? Um, so so just a comment. So Nick, if the work you talked about on the transition in the industrial town is something published, I'd love to see it, just a comment. 
Yeah, it's it's sums in press, sums under review. Um, but I can send a, a couple of papers um, that have now been accepted to the to the, the committee for sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Kirsty, the second question was more about sort of the longitudinal nature of these studies, right? Beyond the siting, mm. right? How important or have people done studies about what happens after the plant is built, and are there strategies to keep that um, interaction with the community positive? Right. I mean, because it affects locally, but I mean, the, the, the story about what happens there will affect others who are considering building similar infrastructure. And I'm just wondering how well that's been done. Seth, this seems like one for you, maybe. I know, and weirdly, I'm going to ask you to repeat that because I was just looking at the comment of Michael Ford. <laughs> oh, aggregation. So I only heard the last half. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not a problem. And I'll, I'll, I'll have to have a talk with Mike about selecting my questions with good questions of his own. Um, now, I, it was really just I'm wondering if there have been good studies um, about beyond the point where you're you're citing the plan, right? You, you're, you have this engagement, and you 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 have a good process. Let's say for a community deciding to build it, but then you build it, right? And you're gonna operate this for decades, right? Do people look at the strategies for continuing to have a good relationship with the community? Because I think it, it seems like we don't talk about that as much, but that that relationship will be important, not only to the success of the project, but to the, the perception around those types of, of, of energy projects. Yeah, well, I think that um, Hank and other folks in Oklahoma have been doing that around WIP. For example, I think that there's some work around that with the again with the um, the chemical de demilitarization program, at, especially the one in K Kentucky around bluegrass. There's been some studies about that, and you know, and I refer to that one in that they, um, you know, they had a very open, engaging process all along the way, um, and then I think at um, you know some of the nuclear weapons facilities as well that. Um, uh, you know, there's been work around these citizens or community advisory boards. And there's some old, old work by um, Judy, Judith Bradbury and some of her colleagues that they were at Battelle Pacific Northwest about um, how those function. And actually they're the same model, but they function differently because of who's leading them and all these things and, um, and who's participating. Um, and I think that's, that was valuable. That wasn't really followed up recently. Um, and uh, um, so there's some studies around that. Um, that could be. Right. I don't know if uh, Nick or Baruch wanted to comment on this sort of ongoing, you know, maintaining trusted relationships. Yeah. It's a great question, though, because it's very important. Yeah. yeah. And I think it maybe is an example of something the nuclear industry has done reasonably well, given the, the higher levels of support in closer proximity. One might look to see where there is neutral, say, NSF funding for that kind of longitude mm. study by social uh, social scientists. I don't yeah. think it exists. Mm. I, I think that there will be people who might, um, well, I don't know, question that, Kirsty, one in, in one aspect of what you said that in the, in, the, in the context of the decommissioning of the reactors in the United States, mm. um, if you if you look at how communities are participating in the kinds of um, their ability to um, um, ask questions and address their concerns about, like for example, future land use, how it's gonna happen and unfold, what's gonna happen to the waste, yeah. those, those by and large are not working as in the way that communities might hope. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that's a kind of an understatement. Yeah, I would too, but I was trying to understand. <laughs> very, very nice um, bit of British yeah. understatement there. Yeah. And a lot of, uh, yeah, so it'd be interesting to look at the incentives and the, you know, the, the structures that have led to this. And then I'm um, just following on from what Baruch said, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to stick in here one of my pet peeves um, mm. about funding of, and about research in the social sciences here in, in the United States. Um, there's an, a restriction that's um, any agency that wants to ask more than 10 people the same question has to get approval from the Office of Management and Budget because of the Government Paperwork Reduction Act. And it really stymies good social science research um, within the federal government. Okay, well, that's on the record now. So that's yeah, very good. Um, 
you guys so, should make a recommendation about it. <laughs> um, I would. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll t note it. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so Ahmed, you, you've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Um, would you like to yeah. ask your question? And then I'll come to you, Richard. And just to make a, a small time note that we have about 15 minutes remaining. Sure. I have a quick one that's also a bit of a pivot. Um, by the way, thank you for the presentations. They were terrific. Uh, my question is to Baruch. You mentioned that you're based in an engineering school, an accredited engineering program, and I kind of want to put you on the spot as a result. Um, a lot of what you're talking about is not restricted to specific technologies. You know, you have this energy transition pathway modeling infrastructure that's been built that has the same problems of arrogance and lack of consultation and all of this stuff. Um, to what extent is this a failure of engineering education? Mm -hmm. And what can we do to fix what seems to be a serious lack of concern for engineering ethics, at least from the outside, speaking as an outsider here, and for the deep uncertainty that's involved in some of these things? Thank you. I, I didn't ask for that question. No, this wasn't pre-planned. You know, I... I, I... I would. I actually think the the, the lack is, is is not ethics because I think you know most people you know, engineers you know like most people are decent. They're trying to do the best that they can. I think that what's lacking is a kind of decision focused social science training with the with the methodology for how do you do this or how do you decode what people are doing. How do you find out what's important what what's important to them. How do you, when you get into a job, how do you argue with management for the, for the resources and the timeline where you say, you know, if we talk to them at the beginning, we will save you in the C-suite from having to put out fires. We will reduce your cash cost of capital. We will increase the probability or make the business case for doing communication uh, right, and then talk to people about their problems. And I think the I think the I think there's a piece missing from most social sciences, which is that engineering orientation. That you know, social scientists study individual principles. You know, like in that list that I had in my in my, my talk. And there's lots to understand about how memory goes, but that's all we know. If you ask me, ask most social scientists, they won't know how to translate that because that's not part of their their training. So I, th I think what's missing is, is a decision oriented you know, projects where you bring together people who know all the social science, the social behavioral sciences, people who know the engineer and the engineering culture as engineering as a culture of collaboration that most of the social sciences don't, which are kind of, you know, if you look at psychology departments, each individual has a lab you know, where they have students who are working, working for them, whereas, you know, engineers are accustomed to working, uh, working collaboratively. So I think it's not, you know, give people ethics, they already feel ethical, it already helps a little bit. I think the problem is, you know, is really a, a sort of decision oriented training in the social sciences, along with social scientists who have that orientation, we're full fledged trusted members of, uh, of engineering departments, and that is extremely rare. Can I make a comment here, a quick one? Uh, a Please. plug for, I think this is sort of shameless, but a, a plug for the program at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which is where I work. We have a, a project-based learning curriculum where every undergraduate has to do a project basically and out of their major and it's an engineering school, right? But they have to do a project outside of their major that basically forces them to ask questions about the relationship between technology and society. And mm -hmm. I think, what they learned there is um, how to ask questions and how to frame problems, right? Um, at the beginning, they just wanna make everything efficient. And by the end, they realize that maybe there's some other values besides efficiency, right? And so, um, but I think these programs are really rare as Baruch yeah. noted. And this kind of multidisciplinary cross-fertilization could benefit so many different professions. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if politicians understood engineering and the energy sector? And <laughs> Um, for example. Um, uh, Richard, thank you for waiting so patiently. Oh, Please. no worries. And, uh, and I would say, wouldn't it be wonderful if there were a lot more journals that did cross, uh, accepted interdisciplinary papers and yeah. things like that. that uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm moving in a totally different direction for a second, I think. 
I, I'm wondering, have there been studies on the impact of disinformation and I would say even active disinformation campaigns, state-led, uh, for the acceptance of nuclear projects or particular technologies? I recognize that uh, there we have, uh, let's say, if the United States does engage and support a, an active uh, SMR export kind of program, uh, there are a couple of other more state-owned, uh, you know, uh, nuclear projects around the world, and they have been known to engage in very active and uh, seemingly effective disinformation campaigns. And I'm wondering, is do you have any studies or experience of how do you deal with uh, disinformation campaigns, and you know, what what might we do for that? And I'll stop there. Thanks. Great presentations, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, so there, there is a vast amount of research on dealing with disinformation and, and misinformation, which has, you know, grown probably exponentially during the during the during the pan during the pandemic, and mm -hmm. and so there's a there's a lot of research you could get people to talk about it. My caution about that research is that unless you do your job right, unless, unless you get ahead of it organize the information, create the trusting relationships, communicate in a scientifically sound way, you're, it's, it's a losing game. And so with the pandemic, which we've all experienced, our authority, our, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, wonderful dedicated people did not get ahead of this and have not gotten ahead, ahead, ahead of this. And it's all playing you know, catch up. Each week they're digging that whole, deeper. So if you're not, if you don't have a, I think in many of these situations, if you're the local and you're, if you reach out, trust is yours to lose. But if you don't reach out, if you don't do a professional job, if you don't trust, trust and empower people in a partnership, then uh, you're just a sitting duck for somebody who wants to in, in undermine you and you're never going to get, never going to get it back. So I, I think that's the case with the pandemic. We're still you were still flunking at central central communication, and you know the, my first point, my first reason for, for for despair. You don't know what's happening. You don't know because you yeah. don't have this expertise. You don't know why your communications are failing. You think the public are idiots. You think that the you know that the that the evil doers are you know are un, are, are un, undermining you, which. Sometimes sort of it, it's a good it's a good ego defense, but it's not uh, it, it's not an effective way to address address the problem. So yes, there's lots of research on, on this disinformation. There are things that make intuitive sense psychologically that are likely to likely to backfire, but all of that is in the noise unless you're doing the fundamental communication right. Just I was uh, in particular, I was wondering if there was anything on nuclear projects that. That people I, I, actually, I don't, be, actually, I, my focus is on getting it right not convincing people what to do and, and so on so I don't know that literature that's I would say I don't know that literature in, in the pandemic either so, but it exists and I don't know what's in in nuclear yeah, the, the World Health Organization coined the term the infodemic um, and saying they're not only fighting the virus battling the virus but they're battling the misinformation and the and, and uh, and that's that's undermining the the response. Um, Nick or Seth, uh, do you have any any comments on this on this question? No, I mean, uh, as I just to endorse what Brooke has said, but that you know, that a lot of mm. attention has been put on misinformation around climate change as well as around now the pandemic. Um, work at Yale and and elsewhere, Stefan Lewandowski at Bristol, but I don't recall nuclear being a, a part of that conversation. If it's there, you know, you'd have to dig and see, see if see if any of the sources they draw on um, uh, talk about that type of case study. Yeah, kind of an email might kind of actually answer that question for you from the people who, who've done this work for sure. Um, but I don't, uh, yeah, like Brooke, I don't, I don't identify a case study or a good study that looks at that. Richard, did you want to add anything? Just again, thanks for really interesting discussions and presentations. So no, I, I, and yes, I personally assume that there will be competitors who will engage in an active disinformation campaign against a 
certain SMR designers, um, given the way the world is working right now, uh, in particular with two of the major, let's say, I won't say competitor states, but I would expect. Yes, um, it's, it's as much about the sort of geopolitical control over a strategic global infrastructure as it is about the other uh, drivers. Um, so we're almost at the end. Um, we, have, we have just a few minutes left. Um, I don't know if any of our panelists would like to just maybe um, make any closing remarks, anything that you were hoping to have the opportunity to say that you haven't yet been asked. Um, or if, uh, if Dick, if, you're, if you would like to, uh, or Kasha to come in and, and offer any, any uh, further final remarks. Maybe I'll do once quick round the, round the panel for any closing insights. Oh, hi, Dick. Just want to invite you politely to. Well, sit. let me uh, give the opportunity first for the panelists to say the last word and then I'll bring us to a close. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll go back in the order in which we came. So Baruch, I'll start with you and with great thanks to all of you for, for a wonderful session. My sense is that this is doable and but it would take enormous leadership to do it and and um, I, I i'm skeptical that it's going to be mobilized and i would be very happy to be uh surprised leadership <laughs> we, yeah, if, if there was ever a time when we needed some leadership it's now um nick Sorry, I was cutting across you. Sorry. Um, one, thing, one thing we haven't discussed, actually, and maybe, again, maybe tomorrow this will come up in the SDS session, is um, you know, how do you engage people about imaginary technologies, I, stuff that is very upstream of um, mm -hmm. either a physical product on the ground, like a facility, or, or, or you know, anything you can actually show people, tell them about. Um, you may not even know what the ultimate design will look like of a, of a reactor like this and what its safety um, proposals will be and what its local impacts will be yet. So do, how do you have that discussion? And there certainly is quite a lot of thinking and methodology around that. I think it started some way back with the National Nanotechnology Initiative here and um, uh, work on nanotechnologies both here and in the UK. Uh, and from a social science perspective, you're trying to do informed choice research. You, and, and that then raises all sorts of questions about framing and you know how you present the risks and benefits and 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 other aspects of a technical issue but i think there are ways of having that conversation and i suspect smr technology needs to go through that process and it has to be done early so the certainly the discussions in 2003 2004 in the uk about this were, were were pretty clear that and and it's rather different from the siting problem where we always say you know you go early you know, even before you've even thought to put it there, because you've got to establish that that relationship with the community. Here, it's saying, you know, can we anticipate the some of the unintended co consequences of a technology? Even our best engineers and scientists can't fully envisage, but you can still have that conversation with people if you bring the right people in the room together, and it will produce some surprising results. When when we started our work on nano fifteen years ago, we thought it would be like genetic modification, and people would not like it. But actually, as it turned out, it was quite hard to, to impose any risk on, you know, nano was seen as just another interesting and good technological development that would have good benefits for people and society as a whole, broadly. Um, and that did surprise us. Uh, so, you know, you may find some surprises by doing that process as well. Anyway, that's my final part. No, I'm so glad that you raised that. And I'm, I think there's a lot of applicability actually to this upstream engagement for the for, to inform these decision making and, and socializing these the, these opportunities and i'm going to recommend this book everybody the science of science communication which uh in which nick has published some of those essays that he was just referring to amongst other excellent work um by many authors um seth um yeah two quick points maybe one is um we didn't really uh, it's probably not the right place to talk about, but there's a lot of terms that we use and they're kind of fuzzy, like support, opposition, acceptance, agreement, consent. And I think that um, uh, it's important for us to try to figure out what we mean by those terms when we're 
when we're doing this. And, um, but the other is I wanna go back to um, um, a paper that Baruch talked about where he and I and um, Jean Rosa and then about 10 other people, I think were co-authors in the science forum where you know, one of our main points was the, the lack of bringing in kind of at a, at a deep way, the social science expertise that's available in, in crafting policies and decisions, you know, and, 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 and programs. And, um, and we saw that, you know, we made that argument with, that was with the Blue Ribbon Commission, my colleague, Tom Webler and I, we've been saying that over and over again. I know Baruch has been saying that for decades. Um, and I think that that's a really critical um, uh, part of moving forward with an, for just an energy transition, right? How is that gonna look and how's it gonna happen? Um, and it often right. doesn't, you know, right. so. Thank um, you. Thank you, I also just really appreciate being here and hearing all these questions, so thank you. Yeah, it's a great discussion. Thanks so much, Dick.